There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. What was that? Man, I was trying to work out some bit about being, if you are, you know, if I was smoking weed. <laughs> I'm like doing a bunch of like magical workings and stuff, right? You'd call me the Brolarian, right? But that's not uh, a thing, right? That's not no, common. No, 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 no. that that uh, assumes a lot of knowledge about uh, Jack Parsons magical aliases. But what's kind of fun about that is that is that then in and of itself a lesson of the mystery schools? Because what I've done is said mm. like, yes, some people would say hacky dumb joke, mm -hmm. perchance from some Seth Rogen ritual magic comedy from 2006, Ooh. right? But again, this is a time machine when we could have been like very famous. Yeah. Mahalo. Like very, very good, right? <laughs> but but instead, what it is, yeah, it's kind of half funny, yeah. right? But yeah. you, you're you going to just shoehorn Mahalo in today. Yeah. But again, maybe that's an allegorical <laughs> thing here. If we uh -huh. do some numerology on Mahalo, how does it break out, right? Because Mahalo is spelled M as in Mary, A as in asshole, H, right? Uh -huh. As in Mahalo. hurricane, hurricane, <laughs> Right, and then I think it's Mahalo, another A. O? A, and no, it's, I think it's Mahalo. Brolarian. Brolarian, uh. though, still at the same time, you have to unpack it, because then you see the term Brolarian, you're like, oh, wow, that's funny. What a funny weed joke. That guy must be fucking amazing in, in bed. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, indeed. But then they really, they pick it apart, and they realize it's a whole, like, reference mm -hmm. to a bunch of books that they should have fucking read. If they wanted to be anybody, that it mattered. All right. Brolarian sounds like a guy not allowed near schools. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to Last yeah. Podcast on the wow. left. I am Ben, hanging out with Henry and hanging out with Marcus. Yeah. Mahalo, everybody. You're just we saying it. You're just saying mahalo a bunch because you drank a bunch of red wine last night, and that has become the weird, your hangover talisman. Just walked into the studio today and just kept going, mahalo. <laughs> it's like, it's not a thing. <laughs> well, anyway, what is a thing is this episode? Wow. We are on to Jack Parsons, part really four. It is the final, and the con it's the conclusion. It's the conclusion. If a conclusion even can be made, because okay. it seems that Jack Parsons' end actually brought a lot more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get into it. So when we last left Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard had just swindled him out of his life savings, literally <laughs> sailing away with not only the majority of Jack's fortune, but Jack's main squeeze, Sarah, to boot. And guess what? He didn't even like Sarah. Wow. By the time it all rolled around, he was so sad that he had married Sarah and mm -hmm. he was so upset with the whole situation. That's when he wrote the affirmations. Yeah, because he was super like bummed out. Now, what were the affirmations again? It was like, I am an attractive man. Yeah. It was where Elron is he showed fucking Stuart Smalley. It's exactly yes. like Stuart Smalley. It's yes. like the mole on your face is not as noticeable as you believe it is. I am a compelling <laughs> writer. Like he says these things. But it's really interesting because, in a way, We'll get into it, but Jack Parsons' journals, they were way more honest and open. But what yeah. Elron was doing was creating the legend from the inside out by lying to the source, which is yourself. Isn't it ironic? Al Franken should have listened to Stuart Smalley a little bit before he got perp walked out of the Senate. Yeah. Mm. She doesn't, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, I'll grope anyone I fucking want to. This is great. <laughs> Thank you, Kissel. Perfect. No, mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> now, while losing Sarah to Elrond was certainly no easy thing for Parsons to deal with, the blow was softened because he still had his so-called elemental, Marjorie mm. Cameron, mm. who, if you'll remember, was the woman who'd helped him through the second part of the Babylon working. And who had helped him through the first part of the Babylon working without her knowing. Yes. Okay. But since Parsons had sold the mansion where the OTO Agape Lodge had effectively set up their headquarters... He moved out of Pasadena and got a job at North American Aviation after L. Ron Hubbard was through with him. See ya, fucker! Okay. <laughs> I love that he made a call, because I, I did read a little bit between the lines. I forgot that Parsons had called LRH when he ran off. And he was yeah. like, okay, I'm like, hey, LRH, I'm having this feeling that you might have taken all my money, right? And he's just like, no, 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 no. The thing was just that we just can't, all right. Because originally they were supposed to truck the boats. Mm -hmm. He's just like, but he got there. He's like, these Wait. boats. We don't want to truck these boats. We don't want to truck these boats. Yeah. We gotta. We got. They're boats. <laughs> we gotta sail these boats. I'm kind of so, with. I'm, I'm with Ron on that. He one. is, but that Makes was sense. the promise, and that's why he's like, that's why it's taking so much longer. But then it turns out he just bought the one boat, and then they just spend all the money <laughs> fucking yeah. and drinking on the boat. One okay. boat, two schooners. Mm -hmm. Technically, three boats, not three yachts. Not, three not the yachts. deal. Not okay. the deal. 
Living in Manhattan Beach in the greater Los Angeles area, Parsons worked on the government-funded Navajo missile program by day, once again a workaday man. But by night, Jack Parsons and Marjorie Cameron lived the lives of bohemian magicians. It's kind of cool. He couldn't, like, not end up in the coolest group possible. Mm-hmm. Like, he went yeah. from magicians, which, I mean, he obviously, argue, we argued last episode, are yes. they the coolest group possible? I don't eh. know. They definitely ate a lot of cum, <laughs> which I love about them. Love them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then they found themselves in the jazz scene. Yeah. Cool. It's all the jazz. I love jazz. We're making jazz here. Sort of. I'm bebopping and scatting. How about you? <laughs> That's all jazz is. That's about the words you don't say. What's her name? Billy Elliot? Billy Holiday. <laughs> It's all, it's all she did was... She was immensely talented. It's not even close. It's not even close to what she did. She's she's a beautiful beautiful voice. One of the most iconic voices it's in scat. American it's history. It's bad scat. Yeah. Billy Elliot was a child dancer. <laughs> oh, yeah. While Parsons delved into tarot and astrology, Marjorie created fantastic paintings. They're haunting. Yeah. Sometimes she would portray famous magicians of yore, like John Dee. Sometimes she would paint pictures of Jack's ex, Sarah, Bleeding out with her legs cut off. Huh. Just to make Jack feel better. Is that nice? Oh, that is yeah. nice. When he was crying, he showed up with pictures of her of his like tortured ex, and he was like, Marjorie, baby, you know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> That's their love language. Yeah, yeah, it is. But while Cameron was certainly a practitioner, she didn't see magic as a practical everyday thing like Parsons did. In one example, Sarah said that a windstorm swept through the house. But while she was focused on closing the windows, Parsons went upstairs to find his magical dagger to stop the wind. Very difficult. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. Because, again, he was chasing after results and synchronicities. Always. Okay. Now, Parsons was head over heels for Cameron, both emotionally and physically. Parsons, it could be said, was a man who loved big and fucked bigger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow, like crumb. Yeah. Mm. The letter. Mm. Yeah. Like our crumb. Well, yes. he means physically larger, but yes. Yeah. And the yeah, the, yeah, you do mean you mean like big yes. big lady he, he love. A, it was a fetish. Oh yeah. no, I mean it's not a fetish. It's called common sense. I love the <laughs> idea. Honestly, like some of those pictures he drew, I was just like, I could put myself right in there. Yeah, like you know, riding a woman on the saddle on her and stuff. <laughs> really big, tall woman. Is that weird? <laughs> His brother was a pedophile. Well, we know that. <laughs> Our crumb liked him extra big. That's how you know he wasn't a pedophile. Absolutely. Well, this well <laughs> can't get our crumb out of my head now. Yeah, I know. Well, Parsons, as far as his physical love. That's more evident in the poetry that Parsons wrote for Marjorie Cameron. Here's an example. Can we play some of that Thalema jazz? The Thalema jazz? Over this? Sure. You you can do it in post. We don't have to do it like this. But let's let's set the mood a little bit. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take my pants off. Sweet. Now, I'm a whip coiling across your naked buttocks. Your flesh (laughs) writhes under my caress and your voice is shrill. With pain and passion. Uh. This is you sensual? Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm, yum. I am a flame that crawls slowly about you. Ooh. I found the soles of your feet and seek each nerve center. Mm. Oh, nothing says romance like nerve centers. No, honestly, he's a scientist. He's a scientist first. Okay. Yeah. But at the same time, Marjorie and Jack had agreed to an open marriage before they'd said their vows. You know, it normally means is that the, the woman seems to get a lot, a lot more, action. more action. Yeah, yeah and that was certainly the case here. <laughs> right. Marjorie was decidedly less emotive and less affectionate than Jack. And while this tended to drive them apart as lovers, it seemed to actually strengthen their bond as magical partners. Well, as we see, what we learn from truly the... It's a classical magician combo. Yeah. LRH and Jack Parsons, it, it, he realized it too afterwards in his journals. Jack Parsons t- realized that he was, he didn't realize that he had created the exact relationship that John D and Edward Kelly had, right? Yeah. That they, it was the same group. But, but now Marjorie, it's, there's something about opposites kind of coming together that it's again and again in every piece of alchemical writing I look at that's always the magic source is that you got fire and stone wind mm. and water you put them together and it right. works yeah Paul Abdul had sex with a cartoon cat I mean <laughs> and I don't think that that should have been allowed no, no. have right. you seen the unrated one? Oh, it's pretty hot <laughs> it's pretty crazy she puts yeah. two and all of her fucking asshole <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> unbelievable mahalo <laughs> yeah sure well for Jack's part he started sharing more intimate details about the Babylon working with Marjorie, Mm. telling her that she might one day be in charge of the working 
in the event of his demise. One day, wow. when it comes down to you women, you figure out how to wear some pants, huh? It's, it's, it's a little bit harder than your little skirts, right? Because you got to figure out how to get your feet through the tiny holes. Absolutely. <laughs> that reminds me of when, when my father looked at his truck and he said, Ben, one day all this will be yours. <laughs> and he meant it wasn't just Bud Light. Yeah, it was. <laughs> well, Jack told her that Babylon was the great work that linked them together. Although he did warn her that if the magic was misused, the results could be disastrous. Interestingly, Jack also told her that he would be, quote unquote, blown away on the day of Marjorie's manifestation. And while we don't know exactly what Marjorie Cameron was doing all day on the date of Jack's death, blown away, wish, wish, wink, wink, is certainly an interesting choice of words. Okay. Now, in a further bid to support Marjorie's magical education, Jack began planning a trip for the two of them to travel to England to meet with Aleister Crowley himself. Oh, and what a fun day that was going to be watching him die. (laughs) Every lady's dream. Yeah, everyone loves going to England, going all the way to England on a steamer ship to hang out with a heroin addict. Oh, yeah. Mm. Cover his own shit. Nice. (laughs) And in the process, Jack hoped to use Marjorie's charm to convince Crowley to forgive Jack for his past weaknesses concerning L. Ron Hubbard. Because mm. he'd, of course, lost all of Crowley's respect by getting swindled by the ruddy-faced Navy man. Well, well you know what? victim here. You can't victim blame. Well, the thing is, in Thelema, and the whole, you have let this happen to you. Yeah. You, are, mm. you are a man of pure agency. He is a man of action. And anybody that should be in charge of a lodge would be able to see his way around these things, according to Crowley. Crowley, how you know it got bad is that he was like, he used to remind me of me. But now he reminds me of a certain Victor Neuberg. No. To, so basically, the guy that he let bottom him out, <laughs> that he still thinks, but he's just like, because again, he was the, you know, the power bottom of them all time. Of mm-hmm. course. Right? Like, he was like Jack Parsons is that guy. The guy oh. that he destroyed with his butt. Oh my <laughs> goodness gracious. <laughs> But just after Parsons sent Crowley a letter stating his intentions to visit, while, of course, also making a case for his own magical growth, Aleister Crowley died at the age of 72. Famously, his last words were either, I am perplexed! Or my favorite, Sometimes I hate myself. (laughs) (laughs) I I can see see it, man, myself. (laughs) Just looking and dying, looking in the mirror, be like, Sometimes... I fucking hate myself. <laughs> That's the sign of a good life. Yeah. yeah. And so Jack and Marjorie stayed in the United States where Jack was about to be swept up in the Red Scare of the 1940s. He was kind of ripe for it. Yeah. See, by this time, the Soviet Union had, of course, become America's big bad guy after World War II. And you may not be surprised to find out that Parsons ran in one or two communist circles in his time as a groovy dude about town. Well, it used to be kind of normal. We talked about this yesterday about how, like, your family, like, in, was it Oklahoma? My that was old, like, yeah, my ancestors in Oklahoma, they were all commies. Yeah, and they refused to leave the Dust Bowl mm-hmm. because they're like, we will organize this dirt. <laughs> we, this, we will bring this dirt. Yeah. It will gain its power. We will organize how to all die of dust pneumonia before the bank takes our house. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's communal living. But it used to be way more not like we, we you know, there used to be kind of like wasn't there like legit communist like presidential candidates and shit in the eighteen yeah. hundreds? Eugene and stuff? V. Debs, wasn't Something he like the that. yeah, he was the big communist back in the day. He didn't do well. <laughs> <laughs> but still it used to be more open and then now we're obviously with the things had changed. Yeah, let's get into it. I always say Get political. That's the, <laughs> you did up top. <laughs> now, Parsons wasn't a communist at all. Quite the opposite. He was a Dr. Demento level libertarian. Hey, is a parody song dangerous or good? <laughs> it's neutral. <laughs> Two-edged it, sword. It yeah. knows no religion. It knows no country. That's the thing, mm-hmm. man. It's free, dude. It doesn't get taxed. God, yeah. I love fucking Dr. It does, Demento. Though. It everything it does. does. Well, because yeah. again, I'll never forget that, that that clip I saw of Dr. Demento at the Libertarian Conference <laughs> playing his own <laughs> parody song from a recorder. Like, he didn't put it in the PA. He put a recording it's, device up to the microphone yeah. and played it. And it's been like, I ain't. Got no taxes. No taxes. <laughs> like, he was just, they are a special bunch. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They take something like freedom and just make it so fucking stupid. 
<laughs> well, Jack Parsons, he wasn't a communist, but some members of the Suicide Squad were communists, or they had communist ties. And additionally, the United States government was quickly discovering that a lot of scientists who'd heavily contributed to the war effort, guys like fucking Robert Oppenheimer, creator mm -hmm. of the atomic bomb, they were either communists or were at least communist adjacent. Now, Parsons have been the subject of an FBI. No, wait, is that true? Yeah. Like, is that true? Because I know that there was like, because I know what we found from a lot of these guys that they were all on fringe. They were all like kind of fringe thinkers within that group. And I feel like a lot of their politics also kind of changed once you made a bunch of weapons for mass destruction. Right. Well, Oppenheimer, I'm not quite sure about his communist affiliation, but like his brother was a communist, okay. like a card carrying communist. He'd gone to a lot of communist meetings. Man. I mean, but that's the thing is that these guys were just sort of free thinkers, open yeah. thinkers. That's why you had a lot of people here in Hollywood that got caught up in the Red Scare because they're, cu do. they're curious people. And again, we're actors, all right? We just like showing up. It was mostly we're writers, actually. Yeah. 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 Don't yeah, actors. Yeah. Those curious intellectual giants that are actors. It's not that they're intellectuals, but they like going places and wearing costumes and badges. <laughs> it's why Scientology applies too, because they I think that's a part of it. Being like, ooh, we get to go to a little house and all talk about voting or like, ooh, ooh. They're, they're like, oh, this is fun. You know, and they're in a circle. They don't understand. Actors are fun because they say stuff like Mahalo. <laughs> you say stuff like Mahalo. <laughs> and so does most of Hawaii. Yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> now, Parsons had been the subject of an FBI investigation ever since he'd started working on the Navajo missile program. And after very little digging, the Bureau discovered a whole bunch of police reports from busybodies who thought that it was worth calling 911 over magical rituals and odd behavior. Whatever. The Bureau, I believe you mean the deep state. Yeah. Whoa, well, <laughs> honestly, honestly. Then... Of course, someone flat out said that Parsons was a communist. They just said it. Oh, sure. sure. And the rumors of voodoo, cults, and homosexuality at the Parsonage didn't help in 1947 America, especially after an unknown source talked to the FBI and described Jack's mansion as, quote, a gathering place for perverts. Cool. <laughs> nice. It's kind of like, like, yeah, I want to go there. Sounds like, a, sounds like an Arby's. Yeah. <laughs> oh, in this economy, uh, that means nothing. No, it really doesn't. Um, but uh, it's interesting because it's, he put that list out, right? When he did the thing where he's like, I don't want any, I want only atheists mm -hmm. to like live here. I feel like there's also those things they attach to it. Cause didn't they also believe that they, they were the, the idea that communism was some gigantic atheist movement that was going to yeah. destroy the beloved Christian bedrock of America, some garbage. Oh, so we're yeah. Worshiping the state, not yeah. God. Mm -hmm. oh. So Parsons was immediately listed as a, quote, undesirable employee for national defense work. Oh. And he was suspended from his job pending further investigation. With pay? No. No. Oh, no. Dang it. No. From there, life truly began falling apart for Jack Parsons. After Jack lost his job, Marjorie decided that even though she and Jack were doing magic and she was painting, they're having a good time. Yeah. She still felt, and this is how author George Pendle put it, she still felt like a scientist's wife. Living in Manhattan Beach. Okay, that yeah, she better. wanted her. She wanted herself. She, yeah. she she wanted to be known as Cameron. Yeah, herself. And so she left Jack to join an artist colony in San Miguel de Allende Ooh. in Mexico. Well, she just joined more people that are going to dilute her personality. No, 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 no. She's choosing this group. Yeah. The last group she sort of was fucked into, like literally. <laughs> so now yeah. this one, she's choosing she a new group. She herself into that group. Yeah, sure, She had but... agency. She had agency to fuck. She chose to fuck herself into that group. She do. Now huh. she's going to go fuck herself into a new group. Yeah. Okay. With Marjorie gone and defense work not an option, Jack Parsons, the founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and sometime master of the magical arts, he got a job pumping gas on the weekends. No you know, kidding. But in he New actually, Jersey. I yeah. love that guy. I love that guy in the fact that he was, because Jack Parsons famously was like, it's just a job. Yeah, like he cares? was not like he was not all like concerned about like the quote unquote drop in status. He was really just like, I got to pay. I got to pay my bills and I'm going to pump gas. No, oh, and I, you know, you don't think I don't fuck. Yeah. That's what I, every day he's pumping gas. You don't think I don't fuck. <laughs> well, it's for me. It's not about a lack of uh, status. It's about a lack of respect. Sure. You know, like this guy is a genius. He's, he's a genius. Brilliant. You know, he's founded. Mm -hmm. He founded the company that took us to Mars for fuck's yes. sake. But this was the time where the gas pump operator really had wise words for everyone. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you'd come by and say, like, oh, it was low. Yeah. Uh, I see that there's a dog that's dead. It's attached to your bumper. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you kids want to go messing around in an old house like that. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. Hey, don't you don't want to go down that. I don't want to go down that road. He's Absolute. a gas bumper. Yeah. Absolutely. That was when it was different. People were... People were more uh, mythical, I think, back then. Wise, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Yes. And it was the, uh, he lived across the guy said, don't go down that road. He lived across the street. That was Fred Gwynn. Yes, Fred Gwynn. But yeah, yeah, he was a neighbor, but still, you'd imagine him. As at the gas, gas station, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. And Jack Party, okay, so he pumped gas on the weekends, spent right. the rest of his time working as a mechanic or uh, as a hospital assistant, just kind of making a cash here and there. Okay. Briefly and bizarrely, he even had a staff position at the Department of Pharmacology at USC, and it's speculated that he got that job because he was really good at making narcotics at home. You know, dude lived the libertarian dream. He had two <laughs> separate guess. high-level jobs that he did not have to go to school for at all. They were wow. all just from his backyard. Yeah. Uh, if, of all of the people that were like, quote-unquote, like self-made, he kind of, he really is one. Like, yeah. he learned it all just from fucking around with gunk yeah. in his backyard. What could a narco- and making his own drugs. Yeah. Right. What kind of narcotics are we talking here? Like cocaine? I mean, that's what I really want to know. Like, I really want to know. Like, Jack Parsons hands you a pill and says, take this. You take it. What's going to happen? I don't know. I feel like he probably made his own psychedelics. Yeah. I think he probably did a lot of stuff. I was actually reading probably this thing. Probably made his own speed quite a bit. A lot. There was a book that's called the, um, it's like, it's the, this gigantic book about this one guy. Oh, God damn it. Where is this thing? So many tabs. <laughs> I have so many tabs. I just looked. There's at least... 40 tabs open. I yes. got so many tabs. But it was this well, guy who sick. made 72 of his own different hallucinogens and tried him, uh, tried it on himself. And each time he did one, oh, yes, here it is. It's called the uh, Pikal, a chemical love story by Alexander Shulgin. And basically, he had this it's one to four stars. One star is like, you get high on it, you can still do stuff though. And then level four is, you lose your personality. <laughs> like, you become the curtain. Ego like, death. Ego death. Yeah. And it's oh. like, it's, but he made them all on his, like, in his own house. Yeah. And then yeah. he just would inject them. And they're like, and then they're like, all right. And then you just sit back. And he looks like a guy who would. He's one of those guys whose eyes are like permanently, like, high shut. Yeah. You know, like, hey, man. <laughs> Hey man, are you a microscope? Oh, you're the mailman. <laughs> That's funny. Sometimes you're all just microscopes. I mean, right, right. Perhaps he has brain damage. Yes. But even though Jack Parsons' days were menial, his nights were still dedicated to magic. Since his elemental was. <laughs> yeah, who's this new elemental? Well, it's a thing. Since she's no longer around to collaborate in sex magic rituals, he oscillated between brief sexual relationships and just plain old hiring sex workers okay. to I just mean, participate in the sex magic. That's what Alistair Crowley did for yeah. years because it's a, he actually kind of helps because then you don't get you don't get all the emotions involved. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Nothing emotional at all. Huh? It's true sex work. It's contracting Great. at the end of the day. Yeah, man. It's like, you know, you know, you know how like Jimmy Carter. Goes and builds all those houses. Yeah. What if instead of he was doing that, he was sucking dick to, uh, through all of these little towns? We just don't know what's kept him alive all these years, do we? I don't know what it is. I heard it was Pedialyte. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, during this time, Jack Parsons carried out a series of rituals over what he called 40 days of madness and horror. Okay. When thoughts of death and suicide almost overtook his entire being, Jack came to think of this time as his crossing of the abyss. The abyss. Oh, my goodness. Now, after this, because he felt, you know how they say, like, in religion, I don't feel this, right? But people have felt this. Or, like, there was letters from um, Mother Teresa, mm. one of the biggest problems. How we know she was a fucking faker and She's a liar. A scam. Right? Yeah. She wrote in her journals that she lost touch with God. That she felt that she used to be in the constant presence of God, and then one day it was gone, and now she's just like this this husk, and she's kind of like operating through like kind of like I should be doing this, but I'm also going to create a bunch of PR ops for the church while I'm doing it. Take a look at my fucking my my hoodie, yeah, whatever yeah. my virgin, whatever her hat is called. I, I don't think she was a virgin. I bet you she fucked. You think so? Hey, I man, think so. A couple of those guys. Sometimes you get some guy dying of leprosy right there, and he's like, Mama. Come on. Just one more time. Just give it one little lick. Well, absolutely. You know? And she's so used to it. She's been so covered it. And she's like, oh, I've yeah. always wanted to know what human soup tasted like. I can see that she may have licked a leopard's dick. Yeah. I, absolutely. But, uh, it falls that's off. Sucker. <laughs> that's literally the word of sucker. 
which is like to give uh, help. What is uh-huh. it? Yeah, and help. S U C C O R. Sukar. Sukar. But um, so Jack Parsons. <laughs> Yes. Bring it all back around. Right. He was suffering from the same magical, like, ab- like literally an abyss. Like, yeah. he lost all touch with it. He used to be such an intrinsic part of his life. And he loved to operating and he used to feel it all the time. He was, again, he was like always with the knocks and the things knocking over and a kind of shit. He loved all of it. He was obsessed with it. But it, once he, it all fell away, he, he didn't know what to do. So right. he was just like, he had a, a vision. It showed back up. He said he was doing nothing. He was like, he kind of given all the magic up. He said he had a dream that Babylon showed back up and was like, kid, get back in the game. Oh, and so he had a, he decided to go back in and he decided to like make this like rip off like ritual essentially because yeah. the crossing of the abyss ritual isn't even an OTO ritual. You say rip off, I say remix. See, he's learning. Yeah, That's absolutely. It. Yeah. Now, the so-called abyss was a concept used by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn as a way to explain the last stage of a magical journey that was supposed to end in becoming one with the universal consciousness. And then Alistair, yeah, it's supposed to be, well, it's supposed to be truly neutral. Why would you ever want to be part of the universal consciousness? Have we, Twitter has taught us one thing. I don't want to know what you're thinking. Well, yeah. that's I don't the, care anymore. I'm done. That yeah. You're talking about the endless creationary mix that lies behind the skeleton of the Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. The universal consciousness is much more <laughs> peaceful than that. I got, that. When we got him hung over like this, yeah. it's kind of good because we can both like convex yeah. at him I'm, with I'm these concepts. railroaded here. Also, that <laughs> for some reason, that did you, you kind of turned me on there. <laughs> very feminine energy you just provided me. No, I have big tit energy. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> but uh, he retrofitted all this. So he, this old, the, 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 the abyss thing, Aleister Crowley branded yeah. after this for his AA, for, for that group. Well, according to the Golden Dawn's interpretation, the abyss is a chasm of existence in which our binary conceptions dissolve. Yeah, dude. And once one enters the abyss, you either pass through and enter a mystical realm beyond good and evil where all is one. Cool. Or you plummet into madness. It's no! madness! <laughs> is it fun madness, though? Or is no, it horrible? No, like, no. Just it's like a, it's your horrible. own skin. You stuff. become yeah. what's his name from The Flash. <laughs> You become that actor. The oh, Ezra Miller? Oh, yeah. Ezra Miller. You become that guy. <laughs> where think... you're just like, you're just like stealing candy out of a bank, like, like at a bank bowl. Like, yeah. And then you run across the street and you grab a child. And then you run across the street and you take all the taquitos off the top of a 7-Eleven. Right. Try to start a little cult. Yeah, okay. It's being out of pocket, I think they call it nowadays. <laughs> gotcha. Well, supposedly, once one does pass through the abyss, they meet the secret chiefs, the highest of the high when it comes to magical knowledge and understanding. And then, and only then, do you become one with the universal consciousness. And if you remember, if we did it from our Aleister Crowley series, one of the biggest schisms in the Golden Dawn was the one guy being like, I'm the only person who talks to the secret chiefs. And then a new guy showing up being like, hey, guess what? Secret chief just called me. I'm the new guy who talks to the secret chiefs. And then oh. apparently the whole thing is that, like, where are these chiefs Se- at? Well, chiefs. Chiefs. Yeah, yeah, where are these guys at? Where, yeah. where are they? Where? Like, do you have a picture of one? Like, do you have, like, <laughs> do you, I want to see their punch card from the local coffee shop? If yeah. I told you, they wouldn't be secret. Yeah. Well, there's the secret chiefs. And of course, Blavatsky also had the hidden masters and she had the exact same problem with people saying, I got a line into the hidden masters. They told me that they don't want to talk to you anymore. And they told me that if you say that you're talking to the hidden masters, if you think that you're talking to the hidden masters, you're not actually talking to the hidden masters. You're talking to somebody else. Yeah. Because I do that. That's me. That's that's me. me. I call them. You don't call them. I call them. Yeah. And they don't physically show up. You just kind of have a a, A feeling feeling that they show up. So you can just kind of say it. That's what's cool about magic is that you just <laughs> make it the fuck up. You just say whatever and you just hopefully a bunch of people in hats, enough of them agree with you. Yeah. yeah. PlayStation's better than all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy that we have like video games and stuff now. You yeah, know, yeah, it helps. Up, like, I mean, I would like to disagree with you, but the number of hours I've logged on my PlayStation I absolutely know. agrees with you. Yes. I know. Well, supposedly the last person to try crossing the abyss was a Canadian accountant named Charles Stanfield Jones. He claimed to have crossed successfully, and he declared himself master of the temple in 1916. No. But was soon after arrested for walking naked through the streets of Vancouver. They, oh my God, he's like the guy from Coney 2012. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I remember that. But you can't seem to separate the two. 
being master of the temple and then walking down the middle of the street naked yeah. in Vancouver. Uh, no. Because we saw a bunch of masters of the temple the last time we were in Vancouver. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, but Charles Stansfield Jones was actually made in a basically a moon child ceremony with by Aleister Crowley. He is supposed to be one of Aleister Crowley's illegitimate children. Right. And so he was made by charged magical cum in a, a uh, actual, what is the real homunculus ritual, which we'll get into later. <laughs> Uh, he was made into yeah. one, and uh, that's kind of what happened to him. I'm right? not trusting a Canadian wizard. I don't no. even trust a Canadian accountant. <laughs> that's a bizarre... That's bizarre. I, I think there, it is wizardry, accounting. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to do magic like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to do magic the hard way, I guess yeah. you can go ahead and Shut keep up. doing it like that. But. Shut up! <laughs> yeah. But the point is, Parsons was using knowledge from other magical disciplines and applying it to his own practices, taking what he wanted and needed for his own purposes. He wanted to make his own his own thing. Because after the Babylon working, he was really sick of, like, I guess working, with, quote unquote, walking the steps of his master. So he was really trying at that point to, how do I be the legit new Aleister Crowley without all the trappings of Aleister Crowley's PR bullshit? He just didn't want to get gaped. Yeah, well, I think that is part of it because he just wouldn't submit, but it, technically yeah. he would not be able to be master of the temple without submitting. That is the 10th level. You're supposed what? to take it up the butt. Yes, that is the final level. That is what you're supposed do to do. Do they tell you that when it's, you're in like level three or actually, when you get to level 10 and they're like, no, now bend no, over. You show up at level, it. you they, literally show up up at level 10 at the the exam. Oh my. Yeah. And then a man dressed up as Saladin, like literally a big Arabian night guy shows yeah. up and you're supposed to you're supposed to give yourself over cuz that's what it is. It's the ego death of the man. Yeah, why yeah. are all these pineapples? What are the what are these going to be used for? You will see, we're oh. making a salsa. Yeah, Dang it's it. It's the Xenu reveal. It's the uh, Xenu. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, you but, thought you were about to ch be in charge of air? Sorry, buddy. First things first. <laughs> well, Xenu, I mean, at least it's kind of fun. You don't have to bleed from your asshole. Yeah. That but, is you true. know, I mean, have a good time with it. <laughs> it's just difficult. But, <laughs> Whatever you, know, but you want to do. Honestly, with Xenu, you just bleed from the wallet. Yes, well, that's, that's Actually, I think that's worse. Yeah. Because yeah. that asshole, it'll heal. Mm. You can, You know. Yeah, no, no, my asshole's been doing great for about a year now. Great. Uh, so Maybe he, longer. <laughs> he's incredible. Year, year and a half. That's awesome, Marcus. Yeah, I, I got to see how the California air is going to treat it, but I'm <laughs> yeah. hopeful. When you, you saw it, you, you walk backwards a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, there's a big practice out here. It's like they do believe that if you show your butthole to the sun like an hour a day, it helps. I've heard of this. Is that helps. a thing? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Actually, it's becoming very big in the alt-right. What? Mm, yeah. Unfortunate. We'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> Jeez, I, I can't keep up anymore. Um, but he put together his own, like, he looked at this ritual, because he knew Aleister Crowley he did this, and he said that he got this word, because, like, so Babylon told him, when he wrote the book of Babylon, there was a thing in there where he talked about, you're going to do this black pilgrimage. And so he was like, this is what Babylon was talking about when I channeled her, that I need to do this black pilgrimage, which is something that only other couple other esoteric groups had, like, even had workings for, because, again, the whole point was, you, if you succeed, you become one with the universe, and if right. not, you become unrepentedly insane, right? A lot, of, a lot of risk. A lot yeah. of risk, quote-unquote. Yeah. But he put this together, and he said that he created his own version of what was called the Great Obligation, which is what Aleister Crowley wrote, because Aleister Crowley's Crossing the Abyss was a 40-day walk across the desert. Do you remember? he In China. And yeah, this he faced the demon Tarazan, but he was in the fucking, like, the circle, and so Victor Neuberg watched from before. It's that story where he, he bottomed out for Victor Neuberg, because this is earlier in his magician's career. I know, but I think when he said he finally crossed the abyss was when he was in China, when he went there with his wife, and he said... Oh, hey, I crossed the abyss. No, well, that's where he the, the ritual was done. Uh, it took several, but the ritual yeah. was the 40-day walk. He got gaped. He, you remember, he fought himself as a demon in the circle. Yeah, Karan's you know, on, yeah, 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 and yeah, Victor yeah. Neuberg, was, he was uh, terrified tempted, of him. He was tempted by both, like, this woman that he had a crush on. Like, oh. she showed up naked yeah, yeah, and yeah, brought Alistair her tits Crowley, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Woo, 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 becoming, on, Victor. Basically becoming Bugs Bunny <laughs> is what he did. Oh. And he loved it, but he wanted to do his own thing and decidedly less sexy. But he wrote these great obligations. So he started calling himself, um, it was obviously Balerion and several different words for the devil. That was how he starts to be. This is his antichrist working. Um, I, O, M, and C, a member of the body of God, hereby bind myself on behalf of the whole universe, even as we are now physically 
bound unto the cross of suffering, that I will lead a pure life as a devoted servant of the order, that I will understand all things, that I will love all things, that I will perform all things and endure all things, that I will continue in the knowledge and conversation of my holy guardian angel, that I will work without attachment, that I will work in truth, okay. that I will rely upon myself, and that I will interpret every phenomenon as a particular dealing of God with my soul, which makes you a very paranoid person. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, did you want to supersize that order? Or? <laughs> yeah, actually... Of course I would. Fantastic. I'm eating for a god today. <laughs> That's good. That's good. We have a we have adult happy meals now. <laughs> I actually would prefer a sadness meal. Hmm. So just a bullet and a, <laughs> and a bottle of wine. <laughs> oh, um, I love that. But he does. He has all these like personal notes where he wants. He's like he needs to be meticulous in his observations, which he was. And where did all those go? We'll answer that soon. Uh, and then you're supposed to be neat. Did you say meticulous? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna start doing. It. I'm gonna work my way out of situations by saying <laughs> that's all you have to do. Fly from your grave. If we're looking at the human element here, mm -hmm. it seems more like the purpose of Jack Parsons crossing the abyss. It was kind of a way to make sense of how his life had so quickly fallen apart after he was destroyed by the psychological tornado that was L. Ron Hubbard. Right. So he got he got robbed. He lost his job. He lost his chick. And now he's just kind of alone searching because he lost his God also. Yes. Yeah. Basically, everything got destroyed. And then because he did write a book, he wrote this thing that he tried to what a lot of magicians do. It's called the, the Manifesto of the Antichrist. That's where it begins. Yeah. Um, and it ends on the analysis of the master of the temple. Yeah. Where he basically writes a bio of himself explaining why all of these things happen to me. It's because I let them happen to me because I was chosen to be born in a certain constellation. He, he recast all of his failures as successes. Okay. You know, it's like everything happened. Uh, it, everything leads to. up to this moment. The I moment had to get be destroyed. I had this had to happen. Well, you yeah. have to fail to succeed. Yeah, there's that's some true. truth to that. I feel like you know what though. It's really a lot better succeed to succeed, <laughs> but it's not possible. Sometimes it is. Some people just do it. Michael no. Jordan. Yeah, he lost. He lost. But he won the more. We know him more from Michael Phelps. Mm -hmm. He lost to depression. Depression. Mm, weed. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan. Uh, he's actually done quite well. That's no, what I'm saying. He lost to the, no, he lost to the Fantastic Four. Ooh, interesting. Michael Jackson never lost in his life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. It's coming child. up a lot recently. He lost his childhood. That's why he's asking everyone if, if you've seen it. Yeah. Damn, if you really want to get depressed, uh, listen to that uh, newly released audio recording of him on the phone talking about <laughs> what, how uh, his father treated him it growing is up. Oh, really, God. Oh, really right. bad. Did you <laughs> listen to it? No. He's just like, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's intense. He's like talking about getting hosed down. They used to cover oh. me in oil. They come and hit me with sweet. It was like, a, but it's also in. It's in Michael Jackson's voice saying the most harrowing shit you've ever heard in your life. Yeah. Dang. All right. Well, after the 40 days were done, he wrote the autobiography, mm. but at the same time, he also decided to define his libertarian principles in the aforementioned political tract, Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword. Y'all need to read that shit. It's beautiful. Yeah, I bet. In his tract, he not only espoused libertarianism, he also responded to his treatment at the hands of the government, denouncing the increasingly intolerant nature of post-war American society. Cancel culture. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, he did make a bunch of bombs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, no, he, he was feeling guilty. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And in this, Parsons was absolutely correct in his reading of the situation. When I say increasingly intolerant nature of post-war American society, I mean basically anybody who doesn't conform uh, needs to get the boot. You gonna get out. Uh -oh. You gonna get out. But instead of suggesting, say, social or political reform, Parsons maintained that the only way to solve intolerance was with the arrival of Babylon. He's on brand. Yeah. Okay. Who would be, quote, gird with the sword of freedom. It's me. Nice. <laughs> hey, it's me, Babylon. Yeah. Everybody free. I feel like that's at the CPAC merch store. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. Yes. <laughs> sword of freedom. Yeah. Sword of ah, freedom. Yes. This commemorative Stephen Miller, sword of freedom. <laughs> now only with three easy payments of forty nine ninety five, you Whoa. too can get this brilliant obsidian cleaver of human rights. <laughs> Whoa. 
No, Parsons actually seemed to be on a bit of a manic kick by the time he crossed the abyss. Soon after the ritual, he contacted Wilford Smith, his old rival and mentor, yeah. saying what? that he, hey, hey. Parsons, was the Antichrist. I'm what? the Antichrist. No, I what? know. Big whoop. Big deal. <laughs> Jumping the shark. But I need a, I need a conference with you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. And Is his... he still pumping gas on the weekends? Yep. He's the Antichrist. So the Antichrist <laughs> is pumping gas. Hey, that sounds like a fucking old-fashioned song. What's this? But, um... The the Levin brothers or the uh, the Leuven brothers? brothers yeah, yeah the Leuven brothers yeah it could maybe I don't know Leuven brothers like to go more old school with it they yeah. like to go very very old it's more of a Jerry Jeff Walker song okay or maybe a John Prine song yeah it's, it's a John, John Prine, Prine song. song yeah I'm just the Antichrist I'm just pumping gas yeah it's, it. <laughs> it's that easy it's a simple yeah. man telling a simple story look at me bend over you just lick my ass oh, oh. <laughs> all right well it took okay. a turn well, you know we need to we need to pair you with a guitarist yeah by the way. I think you need Prine. a lyricist like yeah. a guy who writes the book the libretto yeah. that's what he needs I know uh, by the way the person who writes the lyrics is more difficult than the actual singer but the uh, when we had a chance to go perform in Grand Rapids I, I believe know, the it guy, was Grand I, Rapids I, I actually I can see his point on that writing a, uh, writing a song is much more difficult than singing a song i remember oh. i did see the thing where elton john can write songs off of like instruction manuals and stuff like he just like and he only writes songs that are easy for him to write That's i also learned that billy joel doesn't like we didn't start the fire uh hmm. from who know. he said he didn't like the song because he came up with the lyrics first not the music but anyway john prine's son listens to the show oh hi yes, hi because we had a chance to uh perform in the same venue as they did no oh. way Remember in Grand Rapids? That's right. Yeah. That's right. It was right. Todd Snyder and John Good Brown's work. Oh. Yeah. Well, I love your father's music. And I as I, does my father. My father's a gigantic John Prine fan. Absolutely fantastic. I, and I will discover yours. Yeah. Yes. So we're done talking about John Prine? I think we yeah, could wrap it up. <laughs> All right. Well, using his magical alias, Balerion Antichrist. Thank you. As Henry had mm. mentioned. Uh, actually, it's Dr. Balerion Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to 12 years of Antichrist school <laughs> to be yeah. called Mr. Antichrist. I see. Well, Parsons wrote a manifesto appropriately titled The Manifesto of the Antichrist. Got it. Which pitted him against the evil forces of the Christian church, which both Parsons and Crowley, they referred to it as the Black Brotherhood. What's weird is that it was so unpopular to go against the Catholic Church uh, at the time period that the, it was actually... Was it Catholic Church or just the entirety of Christianity? According to them, it's Catholicism. That was like the big bad. That's the big bad. But yes, Christianity f uh, applies. It is all applied. But uh, the Black Brotherhood actually had to be like discerned by allegory. Mm. Right? Because they went and they were <laughs> the like, allegory. he never said it. That it was the church, because technically he used a lot of, like, Christian imagery in his spell workings. Right. So as the Antichrist, he's good. Yeah. That's how he sees it. If you so. think, totally. well, it's not the Christ, yeah, but Antichrist is about trying to create a movement that is going to take us away from organized religion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how we saw it. The Antichrist is the harbinger of a new era, yeah. of which in, you know, women wear pants. Yeah. You know, I, I'm <laughs> starting to think we maybe need to get rid of this disorganized religion. Seems like everyone's lost their fucking minds. Yeah. So maybe we need to organize a religion again. No, we, need to, I, we definitely need to organize it again. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, all of these people, they oh, lost no, the organization. Need, they lost their fucking minds. They yeah. do. They really actually do need that. We yeah. need I'm to reorganize religion. Reorganize. reorganize. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, while all this does sound goofy, Parsons was using all this imagery <laughs> to make some damn good points. Well, you know, he's also, again, it is good. It is goofy. Yeah. You know, I, I, I feel the vibes. I know. If I, I mean, to try to describe this to my father. I mean, he just walk away from me. Yeah, right? I know that. But to them, it was very real. Well, he felt that the political witch hunts of the Red Scare were, quote, symptomatic of the authoritarianism inherent in the Judeo-Christian values that underpinned the whole country, a belief system that upheld racism Whoa. and the subjugation of women and persecuted free thought. Yeah, man, get with it, dog. I'm yeah. with it. It's, th it's forward-thinking stuff mm -hmm. in 1949. Yes, but put nicely, if we're giving Parsons the benefit of the doubt here, magic was pretty much the only thing he had left. And he'd built oh. his entire life to revolve around magic and magical thought. So he can be excused for mixing in good points with stuff that might be a little difficult to swallow. And All the right. book Sex and Rockets by John Carter, it is a, a, love, a love letter to Jack Parsons. But even they at the very end are like, so science, he had a lot of success um, in magic. 
We all love him. Like, they all, like it was like this <laughs> right. kind of thing. Where, like we loved his energy, but he technically was one of the least successful magicians of all time. Yeah, we say that this hmm. is a story of a student, and he is technically a good student. That's but the idea. I don't know if he would have graduated magna cum laude. I don't know. Again, mm. I still feel like if he had some rearing up in a different generation, who knows? Maybe. Well, he's like John Starks with the New York Knicks, one my favorite player of all time. Not very good. Yeah. What? Starks is your favorite player. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, John Starks. Really? Why? Shooting guard. He says he's Badass not good, though. dude, man. Came out of nothing, dude. Made something out of his life. Well, he had flashes of greatness, <laughs> but then he didn't sleep before game seven against the Rockets, and then he went like two for 25, and then they lost. See, this is how we keep it equal. Yeah. As if he can tell us something <laughs> that he knows. Yeah. He can tell us. Look at it. You just told us. Yeah. I, I didn't know who you. that was. Yeah. John, he's a great, great shooting guard. Yeah. I know John Starks. It's, it's as surprising as a favorite, though. Hmm. Yeah. I used to argue he was better than Jordan, and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but by 1949, two years after the Babylon working and Jack's subsequent break with L. Ron Hubbard, Parsons finally gathered himself and got to work regaining his security clearance. Time to get back to work once again. Okay. In court, Parsons both denied affiliation with communism and defended the OTO, calling his magical order a non-political religious organization. Which is also kind of funny because he had to send a big letter of resignation to Aleister Crowley leaving the OTO because he was so over it because he said you weren't doing the real workings anymore. Now I'm going to do it. And then that's why he did a 12-day ritual where he prayed every day and then looked yeah. at a thing called the Antichrist and masturbated as much as he could. Yeah. And then uh, nothing... To, Happened. Very yeah. communist. But he of called himself master of the temple at the end of it. But then again, the Alistair Crowley said it wasn't legit because he didn't actually pass the test. This is McCarthy era? Yeah. No, no. Jenny this McCarthy. Is, this is before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This Jenny is, McCarthy. This is pre McCarthy. Because McCarthy's like mid 50s, like yeah. 54, something okay. like that. No, this is 49. This is a little bit before that. Okay. Uh, and But back, so they didn't really have any, they didn't even know what a communist really was. They, they had a very no, good I idea of what a communist had, was. The way I feel like at the time they had a clearer vision of what a communist was than we even do now. I feel like that then they like it was yeah. like it was happening, right? But it was almost like the witch trials in Salem because they'd be like, "Well, you had a party and there was a charcuterie board." Yeah, we think you might be a communist. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. They yeah, would yeah, just yeah, throw yes. random, oh, yeah. like if you were gay. You're a communist. Yes. Yeah. Well, they kind of started from the uh, inside out, where they started with these defense contractors. They started with the scientists, the people that were inside, like the defense department and in the government. They started mm. with them. By the time it got to McCarthy, that's when it got out to, to like all of like, us. Like, oh yeah, let's go after fucking Dalton Trumbo. Like, who yeah. gives a shit? He wrote screenplays. He wrote Spartacus. What's Are it? you really gonna fuck with this guy who but wrote Spartacus? Then it really shows how the U.S. government started implanting themselves in the Hollywood system. Absolutely, in order to use the Hollywood system as a mouthpiece for their ideals, which yeah. is, that was a thing at the time. That's not even seemed, a conspiracy. It's no, not. it's not a conspiracy at all. That's a, Ronald Reagan fucking, he tattled, he turned coat on so many people. Yeah. I know when they tried to unionize, so did Hulk Hogan. That's why Jesse Ventura doesn't like him. Yeah. Wow. Ventura tried to unionize, Hogan snitched him out. Interesting. Yeah. And Ronald Reagan named names, that motherfucker. Yeah, he named that monkey like three times. <laughs> <laughs> Bonzo, Bonzo, Bonzo. <laughs> oh, wow. Goes to Bitmer. <laughs> Isn't that great? I I think it's early onset Alzheimer's. Who? <laughs> <laughs> what? But Parsons also tried to move on from Marjorie Cameron. He began seeing an Irish woman named Gladys Gohan okay. and moved from the home he'd shared with Marjorie to new digs at Redondo Beach. Oh. Reportedly, when friends during this time would ask how his wife was, he'd drolly say, quote, She's in Mexico getting divorced. Uh, wait, the, the Irish chick? <laughs> no, his wife. The other one. Marjorie, the oh, other they're one. they're not officially broken up then. No, she's they're, they're still down married. in Mexico. It sounds like she's having a divorce. <laughs> sounds like she's having a great time. <laughs> yeah, she was having a really good time. Cabo Wabo. Yeah, she was getting balled out in a fucking artist commune while he was sitting Woo. here being like, oh, my antichrist. He was feeling, <laughs> being a sad sack. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, divorce proceedings were well underway. Uh, as the 40s became the 50s. Mm, that must have been controversial in itself. Makes him a communist. <laughs> <laughs> but even though Parsons was actively trying to clear his name and return to defense work, the FBI was not quite satisfied with the testimony of Jack Parsons. And Parsons, in turn, wasn't doing a good job of keeping his nose clean. No, because he was a fucking, he's the sword, man. He's mm. Babylon's yeah. sword, dog. Okay. See, Parsons, in true libertarian form, he did whatever he wanted to do using his own principles as a guiding light. That's the whole thing, man. But it's in, like an outdoor cat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But in doing this, Jack ignored the fact that the rest of the world did not play by his libertarian rules. Mm -hmm. Or, should I say, 
his lack of rules. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. And that's how he almost got charged with espionage. It seems to happen what? a lot. <laughs> how the hell did that happen? Was he leaking documents? Well, mm, see, when part- very presidential of him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, get political. <laughs> Mahalo, man. Yeah, Mahalo. Absolutely, dude. See, when Parsons briefly re-entered the scientific workforce, he got connected with an organization called the American Technion Society. The American Technion Society was providing technical and weapon knowledge to Israel, which was then a little less than a year old. Brand new Israel. Ooh, nice. That new Israel smell. (laughs) Yeah, dude, they've had some cool weapons for a long time. Oh, yeah. They got that dome. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, Parsons also got a job working on chemical plant design and construction at the Hughes Aircraft Company, owned by Howard Hughes. So Parsons figured that since he'd worked on this stuff. This is my stuff. This is my stuff. I'm working on it. It's okay to give it to whoever I want. It's just stuff. Uh Uh-oh. Again, it's an idea, all right? Is a piece of paper good or bad? (laughs) No. Is a file good or bad? Yeah. Right? And so he handed the work he did for Hughes over to the American Technion Society, who handed it to Israel. Yeah, well, so I've he learned. sort of like accidentally kind of became like, he sort of was kind of working for the Mossad, he, and he didn't know that. He, <laughs> he, he, got, that. he got a hair's breadth away from uh, giving state secrets to another country. Yeah, oh. He just did that thing. Yeah. Very, very clue of him. Yeah. <laughs> and this, of course, drew the head. Communism was a red herring. Ooh, I love that movie. This, of course, drew the heavy attention of the FBI. Yeah, yeah. And Jack was quickly fired after making a powerful enemy in Howard Hughes, who was a virulent anti-Semite. I feel, I don't know if he's in our wheelhouse, but I would be fascinated to do something on Howard Hughes. He's a weirdo of of the highest order. I mean, I like his, I like, I like him, but you know, I like, like. The story. He's he's the story. Super, super anti-Semitic, super racist. He's got a whole thing going on. But him wearing like the tissue boxes on his food. I don't like him. (laughs) I'm just saying, I like the concept of him shuffling around with all like the long fingernails and stuff. It's fun. Man, I can find you a guy who keeps uh, jars of his own urine. I can find you that guy. Are you about to point at yourself? (laughs) And the guy is me. He's got two thumbs (laughs) and keeps jars of his own urine. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty cool. (laughs) But this episode in Jack's life did have a positive effect. Once Marjorie Cameron heard about Jack's troubles with the FBI, she returned from Mexico to give the marriage another shot. That's nice. nice. Well, maybe she was turned on by espionage. Mm. Perhaps. They stopped divorce proceedings and moved back to Pasadena, just one block away from the former site of the Parsonage. Hmm. Now, Parsons was starting to realize that he probably wasn't going to get his security clearance back anytime soon, if ever. Yeah, that whole given a government secret. It's It's light espionage. Yeah. Okay. So he started working at powder companies again. And by 1951, he'd set up shop right here in North Hollywood with his own explosives business and called it the Parsons Chemical Manufacturing Company. Is that fun? What do they do there? They made fucking booms. Yeah, nice. man. Big booms. They did it for they did it for the they did it for finally an innocent group of people, vaguely innocent. They did it for Hollywood. That's great. <laughs> they did it for show business. They manufactured explosives, pyrotechnics, fog effects. Yeah. Specialization though? Squibs. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, the little Love things that make squib. yeah, they um, make gunshot wounds look realistic. Oh right. my god. You have you guys have, seen... You should have seen the set of that movie Rust. They had uh, some of the best squibs of all time. <laughs> so realistic. Uh, and uh, can you believe it? Uh, have you seen Terrifier 2 yet? I have not. not. Yet. It's honestly it's it's good. It's fine. It's fun. Um but the they finally brought back juicy squibs. See, that's the thing is that there's never going to be a better squib in cinematic history. No one is ever going to top the boardroom scene in RoboCop yeah. when Ed 209 fills that fucking dude. That's <laughs> the best. I agree. Also, Juicy Squibs are going to be performing at the Paramore <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> Mahalo. Yes, you're going to love them. Gonna, <laughs> I'm doing it now. Yeah. I'm doing, doing it for it. him. No, you're doing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, at the same time, Parsons returned to the groovy life, hosting parties for the Beat Generation crowd that looked at Parsons as somewhat of an old man, even though Parsons was only in his mid-30s. See, Parsons, he's still rocking out the classical music. Yeah. You know, right. he's liking the violins. He's getting all weird with it. Well, that's what he likes because that's what he is, his ritual music. Yeah. But, yeah. But the cool kids, 
They're in a jazz. Oh, yeah. that. Remember that? I did before. It's really good. Like Billy Elliot. Yeah. Billy Eilish, maybe? Billy Elliot was that movie about the Irish boy who danced on us before. Again, it's Billy Holiday. It's Billy Holiday. She was, I think that was the one that was Jimi Hendrix's nanny. Oh. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I can say whatever. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking of Slash. I think you're no, thinking of Slash. Slash. Yeah. I wish. Well, they looked at Parsons, these new cool kids. They looked at him as an old fogey. He's still wearing a suit, vest, and tie every single day. He's a bit of a pre-war relic. What the fuck are they wearing? Uh, you know, like fucking Open tank shirts. shirts. They're wearing like, you know, turtlenecks. Yeah, it's Charlie Parker, man. Yeah, yeah man. That's pretty Big edgy. Hats. Those turtlenecks are pretty hip. It was revolutionary at the time. They didn't know that a shirt could extend up to the chest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But Parsons parties, there was still a good time. Charlie Parker came once. Oh, that no it. kidding. Yeah. And then he probably fucked Marjorie. Yeah. Oh. Probably. Well, seemingly infused with a new energy, Parsons even formed his own religion perhaps as a response to the increasing popularity of Dianetics. Mm. Yeah, he was getting, there was a little bit of jealousy in it. Because like, because yeah. Dianetics hit hard. Yeah, it did. And Dianetics is making a lot of money. $600 for the first course of Dianetics. And that's in like 1952 money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. And Jack thought that he needed something to replace the indirection that compromised the OTO. Which is hilarious because it's actually very directed. It's very directed. Yeah, he just wanted to do something else. He wanted something simpler. But the other thing, the other side of that is that that whole like every man and woman is a star thing, that tends to get, that tends to keep shit from getting done sometimes. Yeah, it is like herding cats. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, yeah. uh, but yeah. at the same time, it, what he was trying to do was what he thought that in a way, what Elrond, which we brought up a little bit last episode, is that he took the arcane, highly intense rituals, right? Because I didn't cover g g the full detail of like how these rituals are done because I think it makes a lot of people go to sleep. Yeah. And I think they don't like to hear it. No. But what it is is days and days and days of role playing. Like literally, it's like you memorize pages of, of these like long tomes and stuff. It does sort of seem in a way what Jack Parsons was doing was a proto proto version of chaos magic so, at, at this point where he, what he wanted was to strip it away because he said that in his mind LRH with Scientology was already stripping away a lot of the super ornate ritual shit and trying to get to quote unquote the core which was for LRH giving him money mm -hmm. but for Jack Parsons he's like I want to put the tools of magic to mm -hmm. ruin other people's lives <laughs> like it ruined mine but I want right. to put those tools into other people's hands and I'm going to do it like Sleek. I'm going yeah. to strip it down. Well, his religion would be created for a modern spirit. He wanted it to have a an austere simplicity of approach. Well, that'll be fun. Make it yeah. super simple. That's like, what he wanted. He's, he wanted it su simple. He liked, he, he's trying to make his iPod. Yeah. Although I'm not entirely sure that he achieved this goal based on the religion's description. Mm. Mostly Jack's religion was a combination of Crowley's teachings and the Babylon prophecy that Parsons had created himself. But mixed in hmm. was a horror novel <gasps> called Darker Than You Think, which oh. is a great name for a horror novel. Sure. Did you get to read any of it? I did not. I, I got to read I got to read the synopsis of it. It was published first as a novella in one of Jack's sci-fi digests, and was later it was so popular that it was expanded to a novel. Darker Than You Think is a werewolf novel <gasps> that tells a secret history of humanity. It's cool, actually. Sweet. In which mankind and werewolves have been locked in a hidden battle for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And oh. also the werewolves can sometimes turn into other animals, depending. There are other types of were. There's were pigs and Whoa. were ducks. <laughs> That's fun, right? I want to be a were pig. Uh, you heard you are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every every time I want to know where Kissel goes, I just go, a were pig, a uh, were pig, and then I hear him. <laughs> oink, oink. <laughs> That's uh, uh, Piggies eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember Christmas story. Yeah, it's Christmas time too, isn't it? It is. Yes. Well, in this world, <laughs> in the world of Darker Than You Think, medieval witch hunts were actually a means of protecting mankind from werewolves. And the modern skepticism towards witchcraft is an attitude deliberately fostered by hidden werewolves <gasps> as a way to gain a quote unquote breathing spell. For a counterattack. It's I very it. pulpy. The book's yeah. very pulpy. It's oh, really yeah. fun. It's, it's like I, I read about 50 pages of it. It was like, it's cool. You can find it on the internet archive. Yeah. I love the werewolves. No? I do too. Yeah. Yeah. They're, fun, well, they're fun little creatures. They are. And it's fun to work werewolves into a religion. Why it not? Is. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Make shit up anyway. Just yeah. Have fun with it. Yeah. And the novel's apparently amazing. 
based on the reviews I read. And I'm glad, Henry, I'm glad that you enjoyed it as well. No. And Parsons was apparently first drawn to it because of the story's description of a scarlet-haired woman riding a great beast. Oh. Which was, of course, supposed to be the end game of the Babylon working. But the idea is that we each have a werewolf inside of us we're trying to release. Yeah. That's what that is. The Unless werewolf we is this is the primal energy that we're trying to get to by eating moon. nut butter and, and raw <laughs> liver and, and being natty. Being natty, yeah. Natty. A, it requires a full natural. moon. Natural. Oh, like Are, natty light. No, no, yeah. natural, like not on steroids, like the liver king. Yeah, ah. I am doing a liver king like, and it's my thing. Yeah. What's the liver king? Well, liver wow. king eats a bunch of liver, and then he's like, that's why I got all buff. But it turns out he spent almost 12 grand a month on steroids. Yeah, ah. yeah, he lied about not being on steroids. <laughs> I see. But using the elements of this werewolf novel, along with what he'd learned from Crowley and what he created himself, Parsons created a religion called the Witchcraft, Ooh, which is a cool name for okay, a religion. That is cool. And he br- and he priced a basic course of instruction Ten bucks. That's, that's, fu- that's all you need for the secrets of the universe? Cheaper than Dianetics. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, the witchcraft never got a chance to take off, even though Jack's life was starting to level out by the early 50s. The FBI finally dropped their investigation into Parsons, concluding that while he was certainly a fruitcake, to use the parlance of the times, oh, yeah. it's a fun 1950s term, yeah. he was not a communist. But the damage okay. had already been done. The eccentricities that were excused during the war became liabilities in the 1950s when the existence of all grooviness was threatened by the Levittown brand of conformity. Whatever, man. Therefore, Jack's security clearance to work on DOD classified information and or material was forever revoked. Revoked! And so Parsons decided he's got to clear his head. He does. Oh, yeah, man. It's difficult. I hope he doesn't do it with a fucking shotgun. <laughs> well, no, no, he might do it with nitroglycerin yeah. in a couple uh, of months. Uh-huh. Well, he and Marjorie planned to move to Mexico for a few months, where Parsons said he might grow grapes to make brandy. It's incredible. Or he might build a pyramid to, quote, reestablish the ancient glory. And Very- if I know anything about my sweet magicians, I think once you get to that first level of pyramid, you're going to be like, God, Maybe let's get to the grapes. Yeah, maybe just go with the grapes. Yeah, can you make wine out of those or just eat them? But on the very day that Parsons and Marjorie were planning to leave, Jack got a phone call from a company called the Special Effects Corporation. They specialized oh, in? in special effects. Oh! They needed a rush order on a batch of explosives before Jack left. And Jack figured... Why the hell not? Yeah. I got some time if I work yeah. quickly. And who couldn't use a bit of extra cash before an extended vacation? It seems like something you don't want to rush. Mm. Uh, he went, I feel like that he was distracted. Yeah. Yeah, bit so. Now, when it came to explosives, Jack was what you'd call a collector. His storage space included cartons of nitroglycerin, trinitrobenzene, mm. sure, and a substance known as perm which is apparently one of the most powerful explosives in existence. Okay, I nope. better get that box of that out of my fucking yeah. room from under my bed. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to put it by all these candles and matches and see what happens. We'll see. And this is in addition to all of the other stuff whose properties were only known to Jack. His storage, but like hmm. other you know scientists and pe- people that were into this type of shit, yeah. they'd go in there and they look at all this and they're like, what the fuck is all this shit? And, and he like, goes, that's my family. <laughs> that's <laughs> my family. But he also, uh, he might have been doing a little bit of like light arm stealing as well. Like there's so there's some story <laughs> that he's Seems like you guys are really kind of whitewashing all the the. No, I'm not white. I, I, I haven't heard about this. This seems like one of it's, those it's patented in this one. Zabrowski exaggeration. No, <laughs> it's the Sex and Rockets. They basically said that one of his his friends were like because there was a period of time for like how was he getting his money. Like yeah. it was because in between jobs, they were like, I think we might have been selling nitroglycerin to a bunch of people. I mean, so he's got a bunch of it. That's a thing. Yeah. Like, he's know. got it. Yeah. Closer w- than we are to selling it. It's just sitting there. It's yeah, like, but I don't they're all think- like the clock and the candlestick and Beauty and the Beast. If they're not exploding, they don't serve any purpose. So you know how many times <laughs> right, he yeah. comes home and he's just like, it's like they're all just sitting there like, hmm, just here gathering dust. Yeah, indeed. Also, the can- they made him gay, huh? The candlestick. A little offensive, I thought. <laughs> What? <laughs> the candlestick. Uh-huh. They made him gay. Where? In Beauty and the Beast. Okay. The cartoon. Why is that offensive? Yeah, what are you talking about? Flame. 
Oh, because oh of the oh flamer. God, I just don't. That's even a know. long road to walk, I my just, friend. No, it depends on what they did wrong. Here. I just that's feel Disney like, and they put I don't know if everything too. I don't know if Mahalo is going to fix it. Oh. I don't know if Mahalo is going to fix it. I don't know if the spirit of I've mentioned this before. I've talked about this for a decade. You can you can archive how I've defended. Or said that's a little inappropriate. <laughs> Actually, I could have. I, I vaguely remember a roundtable episode in which there was this. No, was the discussed. original Lumiere was a pussy hound. <laughs> the original Lumiere was <laughs> fucking the the mop. Who I don't it? know. I don't know. The, the duster. The duster. The duster. Yeah. Wasn't fucking Angela Lansbury. Wasn't fucking the teapot. No, I mean oh. honestly, and that's sad. Yeah, she, she should have fucking. She probably. just died. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, whatever. She did. I know. I mean, it's nice. Sad. It's I loved I'm her. Sad. It's sad. I loved her. It's well, as I said, the trip down to Mexico was supposed to be an extended stay. So Jack had emptied out his explosive storage space at the Special Effects Corporation, and he'd moved carton upon carton of highly volatile materials in cardboard boxes oh my God. to the laundry room of his house. <laughs> what is happening? He's a crazy person. And it was in that laundry room full of explosives, using a tin coffee can as a mixing bowl because he had no beakers or flasks on hand to properly do the job, that's where Jack Parsons decided to fill a rush order of explosives. This isn't good. No. But Jack and Marjorie weren't planning on leaving their house empty. They'd already had friends move in to take over the lease while they were gone. Those friends probably weren't fully aware of what Jack was storing in the laundry room when they agreed to move in. Definitely not. Yeah. yeah. But regardless, at 5 p.m. that day, one of those friends saw Jack rushing around the laundry room, pouring explosive liquids from one test tube to the other and putting the results in an oven while he waited around for his concoctions to coalesce. Sexy guy. I guess so. And reportedly, one of these friends said to Parsons, for God's sakes, Jack, don't blow us up. And to this, Parsons maniacally laughed and said, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> I am a little bit worried about it. Well, you saying that actually makes me worry about it more. What about my maniacal laughter? <laughs> Does it make you feel comforted? <laughs> okay. Things will be fine. Uh, it's not often that you get to say famous last words and actually mean them. Mm. They were famous last words. That's the last words Parson said to anyone. What? Yes. Eight minutes later. Two almost simultaneous blasts blew off the doors of the laundry room, huh. broke the windows, collapsed the ceiling frames, and stripped the walls of plaster. And when the smoke cleared, the first people on the scene saw Jack Parsons in a pool of blood, missing an arm, huh. and the left side of his face. Yeah, oh, man. Right. This is, he's two-faced. Yeah. yeah. You're going to want that part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I always like having both parts. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. It does. It helps. But incredibly, Parsons was still alive when the ambulance loaded him up, even though his right arm was so thoroughly blasted off that it was never found. Uh, hear me out. How, how am I doing, guys? <laughs> well, uh, I, think, uh, I, was, I think I'm going to need a bandit. Uh, <laughs> reportedly, Jack struggled to say something on the ambulance ride, but no one could understand what he was trying to say. Ah, uh, whole missing the face thing. Yeah. I thought it was going to be okay. It's very scary. You can't make fun of the victim. He is a victim of explosions. He blew himself up. <laughs> because he's a maniac. <laughs> you see my tongue? Yeah. That's so much here. Here. That's so much here. So much here. It's so much here. It's so much here. Just level with me, Doc. How serious is he? Well, he's just like holding his legs. It's like, which one's left? Which one's right? <laughs> And so by the time Parsons reached the hospital, he was pronounced dead at the age of 37. Yeah, wow. Man. Now, Jack's mother, Ruth, was actually supposed to go on the Mexico trip with Jack and Marjorie. And Jack and Marjorie had actually been living with Ruth in the lead up to their departure. But when Jack's mother heard of Jack's death, she swallowed a bottle of sedatives with a liquor chaser. The huh. only people around were other old people. They weren't quick or strong enough to stop her. Dude, she, he was, she was, her roommate was an invalid. I think that was the term at the time. I don't know if he used that term anymore. But it was a bed-bound woman, right? She couldn't move. She just, whatever. We she know. Old, old as yeah. fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and she apparently just watched in horror as she uh. choked down these pills and then just died in front of her, just going, hip, hip. Mm -hmm. Oh, mama. Camp, well, not, you know, no yeah. one did anything. And right. they're also, they're, their closeness is why there was also sort of like weird incest rumors about Jack Parsons and his mother because they were, but then I didn't find anything else about that. I think it's slander. Yeah, I don't know where you found this claim that Jack I'm Parsons, just, there was I'm a mother. Over. 
Yeah, he found this claim that there was a, a picture of Jack Parsons and his mother having sex with a dog. Yeah, it was a bunch of shit. It's just like, it's all over, man. Yeah. But I what kind of... Well, you must how... have really searched for that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, gonna... it's called research, buddy. Okay. And it's called production. That's fine. And yeah. I'm out in there, man. I'm yeah. out in these fucking streets. So I appreciate yeah. all the research. Well, Marjorie Cameron, meanwhile, seemed to be more single-minded. When she heard about Jack's death, she was more concerned with the three pounds of weed sitting in her house. It's like she did the thing that she, uh, I mean, I'm, I can't even name names. It reminds me of a very specific person in our past that like comes to the house. It's all exploded. And the first thing she's like, oh, no, the weed. The weed. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's the, the weed. Because she has to run again. I mean, that's he, a oh, yeah, serious you know, crime. You go to real then, jail. Yeah. yeah, that's what she was. She was less concerned about the weed and more concerned about what would happen if the gaggle of investigators who were showing up to house, what would happen if they found the well, weed. Because also, it's like, to be honest, it's, it's the one three thing. pounds of weed. That's I know. a lot. But I also want to say, Cameron, listen, the house is also full of explosives. I think they're going to also maybe have a thing to say about the fact that he has been storaging just fucking piles of nitroglycerin. Is that out. illegal? How is this a crime? He's it been, was illegal. It was highly oh, illegal. He just yeah. got investigated for espionage. <laughs> <laughs> so Cameron called her friend Julie and told her to bring the largest purse she had. His old-fashioned <laughs> way to do it, man. And the two women were able to bypass a horde of cops and FBI agents with three pounds of weed stuffed into their purses and clothes. It's like the end of Goodfellas. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those two, That's especially because awesome. it's so it's just so crazy. Like, so much shit's happened, and they lived this loosey-goose life for so long, and it's just, it's just you know, obviously, it spun everybody out. Yeah. I wonder how good that weed was. It was probably pretty mid. I've heard mixed things. I've heard mixed things about old weed. Some people say it's stronger now. But some people say that it was better then. There's but I no still, way it was better then. There's no, no way. way. I mean, for my personal taste, it was certainly better then. I loved weed in the 90s. Well, well I liked, no, I miss what? regs sometimes. Yeah, regs. Yeah. I miss still that. Get them. You can get them. You can, yeah, you you get, I, can, I, can get, I can get you fucking regs, man. You give me regs? Yeah, for bro. Fuck yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah for bro. Living in California now, we don't gotta keep this shit a secret. Not we talk a, openly. Weed. <laughs> I think we've been talking openly about weed for quite a year. We're like two decades. Yeah. But I would Go, yeah, I get by you b bags of shake. All right, cool. Bags oh, yeah. of shake. Loving yeah, yeah. it. Getting into it. All Getting back into weed. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get you my favorite pre rolls. You can try them out. Oh, yeah, thank man. you. Are you a sativa or indica guy? Oh, I'm a sativa man. You want to do, have you ever tried crack? <laughs> <laughs> you want to try it? Uh, Come on, man. Try? Get oh, you we'll some. see. I don't know. You know, California. Right. Mar Los I'm still not I'm California Marcus. I don't know if that works. Marcus, California. Maybe LA Marcus. Hollywood Marcus. Hollywood Marcus. Hollywood Marcus. 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 Yeah, Hollywood, Hollywood Parks. Hollywood yeah. Parks. But then that's just a park in Hollywood. That's hmm. the Hollywood Parks system. Hence the crack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know, I like Hollywood Marcus. Let's go for it. Mahalo, man. Mahalo. Absolutely. Live from your grave. Now, the investigation to the explosion found residue of mercury fulminate in a shredded coffee tin. It's assumed that Parsons had been using the coffee tin to mix the mercury fulminate because Jack's friend had seen Parsons using a coffee tin earlier. Because that's the thing is that some Jeez. of his friends are like, oh, Jack Parsons, he was too meticulous. He would never use anything like that. But no. Absolutely not. <laughs> it was like a friend, a woman actually saw him like mixing shit in a coffee tin. He's like, yeah, I don't have my beakers. Don't have anything here. I'm just having to use this coffee tin. But that's also Sticker. how he invented the fucking Jado. Mm -hmm. Like, it's how he did it. Yeah. They're all just making it up as they went. Well, it's thought that Jack may have accidentally dropped the tin and tried to catch it before it hit the ground. But when he whiffed it, the tin exploded when it hit the floor because mercury fulminate is highly volatile. He you, did. Ever, you ever seen Breaking Bad? Of course, I've seen some episodes there. I watched the last episode and I watched the whole thing in reverse. He turns out to be a great teacher. Um, he, <laughs> he, died, he died a nerd's death. He did. This is like the nerdiest way to die. I actually don't think so. I think the nerdiest way to die is to choke on a protractor. I think that this is actually a very, like, this is a cool way to die. I don't well, know. Oh, my beaker. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, it, it, no. If he would have caught it, yeah. he yeah, sure. would be alive. Yeah, I don't want to die in a goof him up. I don't, I don't want no, to. No. I, I'm so afraid that my last word's going to be, oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> and then that's it. Yeah, no, I just don't want my last words to be, wait, 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 w
first season of episode two, remember when Walter White comes in and he's got that bag and he throws it down on the ground and it blows all the windows out and yes. he convinces oh. Tuco that's Mercury Fulminate. Yeah, okay. science. Yeah, and that's the thing is that Mercury Fulminate, he might have been able to survive that blast. You know, it did, of course, blow his arm off and it did, you <laughs> yeah. know, it blast off half of his face. Yeah, but we got boys on the, on the you know, fighting in the wars yeah. that had the same shit happen to them and we patched them up. But the problem is that the laundry room was filled with explosives. Yeah. Right. It was all the other explosives. So when the mercury fulminate went off, all the other explosives went off almost immediately after. It's and Looney Tunes. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you think Marjorie is still going to like <laughs> <laughs> No, his He's job. Like, come here, Kurt. Just, just, just sit on my face. Just one last time. <laughs> Please, God. Now his jawbone was exposed. Great. His teeth were exposed. It's He's cool. all fucked up. That, however, is the accepted version of the story. Mm. The one put forth by the authorities. Lamestream media okay. wants you to think that that's what happens. The fact that he was also very clumsy. Yeah. Well, true to a man of Jack's reputation, his death in the years since has become shrouded in the shadow of both multiple conspiracy theories and the possibility that his death was a case of magic gone wrong. I mean, I think it's exactly what he would have wanted. It, it is really is. He, he his, loved his, it. his death just became another mystery for other people to decipher. You, you say conspiracy theory. Uh, how did they somehow blame the Jews for it? Um, we'll get because to every it. conspiracy. You, know, you mean the somehow. term "merchant," which I read in the group <laughs> okay. in the book about yeah. the Saturn Death Cult. So. That's, if anyone's in conspiracy theory, they always just end that way. So. Well, actually, this one: Are the Jews involved? Yes. They are? They are involved, but not as the perpetrator. No. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Of course, the FBI file surrounding the investigation to Jack's death is heavily redacted. That is interesting That's of itself. That's very interesting. And that leads some to believe that he might have been killed by any number of people or organizations, mostly for political reasons. Some think that Jack Parsons was killed by Howard Hughes as revenge for handing over company secrets to the Israelis. Mm. Because as I said earlier, Hughes was a well-known anti-Semite. Mm. And relatedly, some think Jack Parsons was murdered by anti-Zionists who killed anyone who was even tangentially involved with the state of Israel. So involved. So yes, part of the conspiracy theory, but That's not one. the perpetrators of the conspiracy theory. I say drop the hate. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Drop the hate. Wow. Add you heard love. it here first. You heard it first. Love. Wow. There were even rumors that Parsons was killed in a revenge served cold, Ooh. stemming from his testimony years before that had put away LAPD officer that had put away LAPD police chief Earl Kynette, yes. who had, if you'll remember, tried to assassinate a fellow officer in a car bombing to cover up corruption. And that's the, actually the one of all of them that I think that could have been a thing. It's that one, but I don't know. Possibly. That reminds me of when uh, we the Fleshbot Awards, I gave the uh, Best Mainstream to Porn Award to China, the oh, WWE yeah. wrestler, and she yes. went on YouTube that night, and she said, Vance, holding the silver dildo I gave her, Vance... To Vince McMahon, revenge is a dish best served cold. And then she held up the silver dildo, the big dildo. Yeah. Wait, because the the dildo was itself cold? Yeah. Well, I don't know because she was like, it was "See, a, Vince, I made it. I got a porn award." It was oh. a cold was night. Door to China. It was a night in February. It, it should really have been cold. hot because her. Didn't she want her her vagina to be like wet and and receiving? I don't know exactly what happened. I, yeah. She's. I mean, I don't know. I'm just being a backseat. It was a smuggling. It was a movie about man, smuggling. Huh? Her clip was quite large. Huge. Oh, I remember. Yeah, yeah she was yeah. she was on the juice. She well, wasn't natty. Her. She wasn't natty. No, not natty. But in an explanation of suspicion that smacks a bit of Building 7, the reason why most people at least entertain the idea that Parsons was assassinated, that's because a chemical engineer named George Santmyers said that the explosion could have only come from beneath the floorboards. It's not the way. There's no other possible oh, way it could have no come from anything way. else. Do explosions, thumb me, thumb this, right? The explosions just come from the sky. Yeah, you're saying missiles, sure. Kind but of I, I, let's just say anything thunder. else. No, no, I just, hey, fuck you. I'm the expert, right? <laughs> okay. Fuck you. Fuck you, buddy, all right? Because explosions only come from the ground up. But what about right? Because the... they're like potatoes. But the... All right, they come up like the carrots. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's what comes from the ground. It's explosions to carrots. All right? I ain't got yeah. time for this. Well, Why are you oppressing me, buddy? Oh, I'm, the room is full of explosives. <laughs> yeah, but it could only. he says it could only come from beneath the floorboard. But what about the room full of explosives? But the first explosive, piece of shit. not the second explosive. You know that's the second. Being... The room full of explosives. That's the second explosion. When he's like this, he's being very unmahalo. Right <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm a, I'm using this like a weapon. I, it's my it. two-edged sword. I, I know it is. But that's the thing. A lot of this doesn't make any practical sense. First of all, 
It's a pretty piss poor operation that waits until the day before Jack moves to Mexico to blow him up using a Byzantine plan to lure him into his laundry room with a last minute explosives order from the Special Effects Corporation, which would have required the involvement of multiple witnesses. You fucking simp. <laughs> I can't even believe this fucking guy after all these who years. I, who am I simping for right the now? The U.S. government. All right, because when it comes down I'm to it, of course they would choose the most highly unlikely, nay, impossible <laughs> way to kill him because truth stranger than fiction. Oh, I, I don't see. know why they would. Truth though. stranger than fiction. It can be. It always, <laughs> it always is. It's not always. The second, if you wanted to kill Jack Parsons, wait a day mm, until yeah. he's in Mexico. You do it quickly and quietly. You also could have just shot him in the head. Yeah, in Mexico. Yeah, and you definitely or you could have laced his drugs with shit yeah, or yeah. any of his stuff yeah. or anything. Yeah, Charlie Parker could have got in there because <laughs> he was on so many heroin. You know, you could have told me it was a saxophone. He had Absolutely. no fucking Absolutely, hit him with a guitar. All of this seems much more covert than using a massive explosion on Millionaire's Row in Pasadena that very well could have killed dozens of people had the conditions been just a little different. That was to send a message. To, oh, to it was to send a message what? to who? Jazz. About what? Don't, about jazz. It's about jazz. You didn't listen about to jazz. jazz. To yeah. who? I'm not even going to answer. <laughs> gonna answer. I, the audience can't see it, but I'm giving you the. Hmm? Yeah, they give me the. Hmm? You also, <laughs> did, but you didn't explain what the is because the audience is an allegory. <laughs> they know. discover, decipher. They can see. Yeah, it. but when it comes to allegations of magical ritual gone wrong, this is more where the human element comes into play. See, some say that Parsons had accidentally summoned a fire demon. But if because it's all in his writings, right? The Book of Babylon says that, you know, he's going to sure. die in flame. He talked right. about sure. being, being blown away. You remember quotation marks, winky wink, right? It's a fire but demon. If that's true, why it's was... It's not true. <laughs> well, let's, not, let's entertain the idea yeah, of a be, fire be demon. Be in the world. You, be We're going to entertain the idea of a fire demon. I need you to be a little more mahalo right now. Yeah, dude. Because you're being mahalo. very mahalo no <laughs> okay, right now. All right. So a fire demon. Yeah, but let's say if that's true. Why was it's he? It's not true. <laughs> Let's just say, presuppose. <laughs> okay. Presuppose we're in a world where all of yeah. this is real. Okay. But if that's true, why was he summoning anything on his way out of town that when he had a last minute explosives order? That's, that's the issue. It's about, it's about time management. Issue. It's okay. about time management. It's about I'm thinking about that's the issue. It's why about like, have I passed? Because he has a vacation. Yeah. yeah. So why would he, fly? <laughs> why why would would he summon the fire demon that's totally real if he has a vacation coming up? See? Wow, yeah, that's, I mean, like, if that's true. Pretty <laughs> that's, pretty wow, yeah. Because oh, again. Wow. Yeah, why, that, that, that's, not, that's not logical at all. <laughs> wow. That's, that's fucking brilliant, guys. That is Hours of brilliant. research. I know. I mean it, man. Hours of research. I, know. I read four books. Yeah. I read four books. I know. I know. I production calls. I know. I know. It's a lot of research. This is four, it's a four-parter. Yeah, four man. It's a four-part series, so. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, to that same point, right. Others in the magical community, they said that Parsons was trying to get, <laughs> create a homunculus. <laughs> okay. It's real. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you know what a homunculus is? I don't know what a homunculus. It's is. a tiny version of yourself. That's All right. It's a little. It's you trying okay. to make a Barbie version of yourself. <laughs> I'm like so angry. I'm like, the whole it's you. six <laughs> hours of show. Six hours of show. Yeah. No, no, it's big. It's big. Okay. And, but, that's the thing, so the whole thing went right. sideways. See, according to the alchemical writings of Paracelsus, Correct. which were kindly summarized in the Wikipedia entry on homunculi. Disgusting that you would do that. You would truncate the reading like that. <laughs> a homunculus can be made by putrefying one's own semen oh. in a sealed gourd. Mm, like in um, that Timothy Shamalama Ding Dong movie. Yeah, preferably Fantastic. you want to use a cucurbit mm. uh -huh. if yes. you want to do it right. And you're going to keep it for 40 days at the temperature of... Of a horse's womb. Oh, what mm. the f and okay. eventually, which is just a nice. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like San Diego. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm assuming it's probably 98 to 100. It's 100. Degrees. It's 98 to 100 um, degrees. I looked it up. Yeah, okay. it's about 100 degrees. A cucurbit is a melon. Yeah, it's a melon. It's a gourd. It's a gourd. It's a gourd. Okay, so and you come inside of a gourd, you put it inside of a horse's womb. No, no, you, you treat keep it, it like the it temperature was. of a horse's okay. womb, and then eventually the cum will come to life, and you feed it for human blood for 40 weeks, always keeping it at the even temperature of a horse's womb. And then after 40 days, a tiny little version of yourself. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> hey. hey, how you doing? You guys like jazz? Oh. I don't. I like classical music. I'm like Jack. Remember Little Penny? Little Penny. Penny. Oh, yeah. yeah Little Penny. Yeah, it's him. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah that's, a, guys. that's a homunculus created from Penny Hardaway's 
Come. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. According to the Secret Rituals of the OTO, which is a book that like breaks down the symbolic meaning of a homunculus, right? Is that partially what you're supposed to do? Again, spiritual revolution, mm, right? Okay. He's not maybe making a direct, actual carbon little tiny person version of him because even though that would be cute, it would be fun. It'd be kind of fun. Cause wouldn't it be kind of fun, right? You were having sex with Carolina. Yeah, right? I'm putting yeah, this yeah. on your head. Yeah, right? put it on me. Put you're it on having me. sex Great. with Carolina, right? Yeah. But then you have a little tiny you that can jump around. Play with her butthole, huh? Like, well, you're nice. fr- you're in the front, yeah, right. I'm or in the maybe, front. or he's do, or he's working the, he's working the. He's clitoris. doing whatever he wants to do, but he's yeah. there because he's your husband. She's he's also her husband. Yeah, I know, but that he's still going to do what he wants to do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because yeah, he's you. <laughs> yeah. Well, how would you feel? Ah, uh, with a tiny little version of myself, I would ask her how she felt about it first. Oh That's yeah, I forget about That's her. Respectful. I forget <laughs> that she should be I would included. First, I would first. <laughs> Have a conversation. You pull up about- little Marcus, be like Marcusini wants in, right? And be like, I don't know if I want Marcusini in me tonight. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing she's gonna say no. Probably no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. a little penny on the other hand. <laughs> According to the secret rituals of the OTO, the ego is not installed into a fetus until it is at three months. Okay. And so up until three months, you can do magical workings and replace the ego of the fetus with anything that you want, anything, any kind of elemental imagery. I don't mean to pain you, yeah. but it is that. And then you cycle it out and then you give birth to a child. That's what Alistair Crowley did. Okay. Great. Right. Well, I'll go home and I'll ask, I'll ask my wife. I'll ask Carolina. I would I'll, love I'll an ask, update. I'll ask her about it. Remind me to cut, give you an update next week. I'll call yeah. her tonight. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I'm going to ask her. Good. Because <laughs> I don't want to speak for her. Now, call me crazy. Okay. You're crazy. <laughs> you did it. But it seems like the death of Jack Parsons involved just a bit more heat than a horse's womb. And besides, it would have been odd for Parsons to rush his homunculus before going out of town. Because it's not like he had a plane to catch. <laughs> right. He could just, he just <laughs> leave the next day. If my yeah. homunculus isn't done yet, let's leave on Thursday. I hate rushing my homunculus. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I need my time. Yeah. This is my homunculus time. Yeah, and that's the thing. Is that I don't know. What did he need to rush it for before he went to Mexico? Did they need something fun in the car to play with? Did I you, mean, it would be kind of cute. Yeah, you did would. you play basketball with a football as a child? <laughs> <laughs> Me or Jack Parsons? You. No, I play football with a football. Yeah, he played football. He I was, was a, I was at Gex Pre all district. All right. Yeah. yeah. Him and Crowley, wide receivers. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah. more like a tight end. Yeah. Uh, I played safety and running back, my oh, friend. Yeah. I could actually see you being a great running back. I was actually very much better running back than I was a safety. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I could see that. Yeah. Well, really, if we're done with that. We are. The most likely explanation for Jack's death was put forth by his old friend, Ed Foreman. Mm. And Ben, you might be right in uh, saying that it was a nerd's death. You know why he died? Why? Sweaty hands. Yeah, man. He had like clinically sweaty hands. He was like one of those dudes where he had to like, he, he would probably get a procedure now done. To stop I his heard hands. if you have that procedure done, you just sweat elsewhere. Yeah, it's not good. Oh. It's why the sweat it's why they also go be- somewhere. They believe that Bruce Lee died of hydrosis, that he was drinking too much water because he got laser treatment on his armpits because is that he right? didn't want, yes, that he didn't want, this is a theory, new theory, uh-huh. because he didn't want people to see pit stains when he was on film because he thought that it looked undignified. Oh, oh wow. Oh, that's horrible. It means sweat, nothing. It I don't know if it's s- real. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, usually Jack was meticulous in his work, but in using shitty equipment oh. for a rush job, Jack's hands got slippery. Jack got himself killed. God dang. Now, sadly, Ed Foreman was sort of broken by Jack's death. He was reportedly aggressive and withdrawn after his oldest friend was blown to bits. Yeah. And Foreman claimed to have been visited years later by Jack Parsons' spirit during one terrifying night driving alone in the desert. Hey, guy, you got any gum? Hey, buddy, you got any gum there, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> Marjorie Cameron, meanwhile, fell apart after Jack's death once the reality of the situation set in, and she lost her grip on reality completely. She burned her possessions and claimed that she was the scarlet woman summoned from the Babylon working. Consequently, she was briefly in- institutionalized. Yeah, once you start yelling about being an ancient Sumerian like goddess thing, everyone gets all concerned. Yeah. Yeah, and they would just institutionalize a lot of people they back did. then. They, they really they? would. Yeah, they, they really would. But once she gathered herself, just like Jack had done after he crossed the abyss, Cameron returned to California, got more interested in witchcraft and magic, and continued living the groovy life for the next 40 years. Interesting lady. Mm -hmm. In addition to becoming a well-respected creator of haunting paintings, Marjorie acted in a number of films directed by well-known Thelemite Kenneth Anger. There is some, there's a view that she gave him. 
the uh all of the stuff like yeah. gave him like showed him Philemon. Yeah, Ooh. showed him Philemon. Remember Kenneth like that's all wrapped up with Charles Manson. Oh yeah. And Marjorie Cameron once claimed to have participated in a reverse gangbang with Bob Hope after Bob Hope told her about that one time he saw a UFO. I can't even Wait. think of Bob Hope with an erection. Yeah. Oh, I can. Yeah, Bob Hope. Oh, yeah. yeah. You really you... think that he worked it? Oh, yeah. I think so. Bob that... Hope back in the day, dude? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. weird, like that weird little, like, they... when he juddered his yeah. dog. Yeah. 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 Some so, of those, though, I remember seeing my grandfather in his underwear, like, they get old-style, like, boxer short. You yeah. know, there was, like, a full pant? Yeah. That he wore to, uh, just something about Bob Hope with those around his ankles with yeah. his USO oh, hat on and his yeah. weird, like, so fluorescent he was, pink. He was had a bunch of chicks gangbang him? Yeah. Yeah, it was Marjorie and a couple of her friends. They showed up at Bob Hope's house one night. They started talking about UFOs. Before you knew it, everyone's naked, and Bob Hope's got the biggest smile on his face. And that is called the UFO effect. There. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But no matter what Marjorie Cameron did, the presence of Jack Parsons haunted her, although she did seem to enjoy using Jack as a handy tragedy to hang her hat on. Well, it made her very mysterious. Yes. This, of course, led to problems, mostly from jealous lovers. See, much of Jack's writings on magic, including his quote-unquote magical box, they were destroyed in the explosion that killed him. But the surviving documents were entrusted to Marjorie Cameron, who wasn't what you'd call the most responsible archivist. Hmm. First, a jealous lover destroyed Jack's magical diary because he wanted to replace Jack as Marjorie's magical partner, believing that she'd never get over Jack unless all vestiges of his memory were incinerated. He's dead. Who cares? I, the thing about if you're trying to have sex with a widow, you got to act like the husband was cool. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I didn't mean it. Course. If she loved the husband, you're like, oh, man, I wish Steve could see me banging you. <laughs> yes. You're like, I miss He'd Steve too. He yeah. loved this. Yes, he was a cool guy. The rest of Jack's magical manuscripts and his occult library, they were entrusted to a public librarian. But since I suppose Marjorie didn't stress the importance of the collection, librarian just threw it all away. That's on the librarian. They should take everything seriously. To be honestly, a librarian, that's like kind of like the opposite of what librarians are trained to do. It is the exact opposite. They're supposed to archive. Yeah. But at the same time, Marjorie was also key to our understanding of the Babylon working. She was contacted by Aleister Crowley's archivist, and she was quite open about the ritual. Because, of course, fucking L. Ron Hubbard never talked about it. No, so, no, oh, no, no. He, well, L. Ron Hubbard, he stopped it. Yeah. He yeah. stopped it. Yeah, oh. he stopped it. Remember, he stopped it. He was sent there by the Navy to, rip to break up, up a <laughs> black yeah. magic cult. Uh-huh. And, oh, yeah. And rescue a girl. Uh, definitely. Uh, that's what yeah. the Navy does. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure he knows what the Navy Ask does. my father. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. By the 70s, Marjorie Cameron had taken to carrying around a velvet bag that she claimed contained the head of Jack Parsons. That's cool. And she was quite charmingly known to say that all Scientologists were bastards all right. and didn't hesitate to say that to the face of every Scientologist she met. And they went, <laughs> yeah, ah, ah, very good. Ah, <laughs> ah, <laughs> can I jump on your couch? Ha, <laughs> Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. Kirstie Alley's dead. Yeah. We know. Yeah. We know. Gal G- G- got himself another angel. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who got himself another pilot? <laughs> but in the end, Cameron seemed to enjoy the mystery of Jack's death just as much as Jack would have enjoyed it. Hmm. She always acted as if the official narrative was uncertain and sometimes even suggested that the government had faked Jack's death Uh so they could whisk him away to work on other covert operations. This is all y'all's job if I die is to maintain the mystery of my death. It's the idea of it. Mm -hmm. It's that hopefully if it all works out, if it goes according to plan, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. Yeah, you often say you're not going to have a head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's going to be big. Yeah. Okay. And so just know that we were like, oh, yeah, you know, I don't know what. I heard Henry was but, channeling the the panty crisis. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. that's oh, what it was. Brilliant. <laughs> I, but I don't think Jack Parsons wasn't like muddling guacamole. He wasn't like making salsa. Yeah. I, I might die a salsa gonna... related death. I don't know. But <laughs> keep it mysterious. Sadly, though, Marjorie Cameron died in 1995 oh, wow. of yeah. a brain tumor. And reportedly, her last words were just as amusing as her life. She said, quote, The dog's dying. The car's dying. I'm dying. We're all dying. <laughs> I like her. I like her, yeah. And, and again, go, she went as Cameron by then. Now she's Cameron. Yeah, she Cameron. She hated the name Marjorie because remember that was the name of the aunt that haunted her when she was a child. Mm. Yeah. Went by Candy sometimes. Okay. I love a good Candy. Can, Absolutely. Candy, candy. Candy, Cam- candy Cameron. Huh. Candy Cameron. Candace Cameron. Indeed. <gasps> Murphy Brown. 
That's the formula. The Murphy Brown incantation formula. Did you know that Murphy Brown hated her father because he was a ventriloquist and she always felt that he loved the doll more than he loved her? We put more money. I can't believe how much. There was literally several million dollars were spent to bring Murphy Brown Brown back. Yeah. Really? And it did nothing. And it's garbage. I can't believe when it. When did that yeah. happen? Yeah. I I know, exactly. Yeah. But no, she hated the ventriloquist. She always thought the the ventriloquist that she was competing with the ventriloquist as an actual sibling. Oh. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. Sure. Well, as far as the legacy of Jack Parsons goes, yes. people are somewhat split on how important his contributions were to the history of 20th century science. The more button-up types say that his role is exaggerated, but that's only because Parsons didn't publish papers. Mm. And he was, again... Just a little too groovy for the scientific establishment. Yeah, a little odd. Well, little they didn't like that he didn't have degrees and he wasn't passed. That's the whole thing. He wasn't passed by the inside group. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't do it the right way. He didn't do yeah. it the right way. Yeah. And, then, you know, he just didn't, he didn't pay the money. Yeah. From what more open-minded historians say, Parsons was a key figure in the road towards space travel and exploration. And the company he helped found was responsible for flawlessly landing the Mars Curiosity rover amongst many, many other accomplishments. But the more interesting question here is whether or not his magical work mm. had any bearing on the world we live in today. Aliens! <laughs> aliens? Yes. He made aliens! He made aliens. Well, some say that the Babylon working ripped a hole in reality. Aliens! <laughs> oh. Because the bear... God damn it, quit interrupting me by yelling aliens! Aliens? <laughs> <laughs> he did it. Because the very same year that Parsons claimed to have finished the ritual, the Babylon working ritual... The Roswell incident occurred, mm. and UFO sightings <laughs> have not slowed down since. Coincidence? <laughs> well, it's He's not one. No. <laughs> well, Alistair Crowley also claimed that World War One began because he fucked up a ritual. And who knows? Because I mean, but again, that's magic history. Yeah, and it's the idea that he fucked something up. He did bring in the Aeon of Babylon, and we're seeing it unfold. And a part of that mm. is replacing the old gods with new ones instead of seeing elementals like fairies and alien and like instead of like that we're now seeing our new technological gods. Mm -hmm. Isn't it OCD? Isn't what OCD? What Alistair Crowley thinks. Oh, he, it may, I mean, he might. Because he thinks that he brought, I mean, World War I was going to happen if he got butt fucked or not. Yeah, but he liked the, he was bragging. Yeah. Oh, he, he was, was like, I did, I did so it. hard, yeah. I caused World War I. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I see, okay. Yeah, but a coincidence does have to be taken into account. Coincidence. Mm -hmm. But it must be said that Jack Parsons' life was almost defined by the phenomenon of mysterious coincidence. That's true. No matter what, though, Jack Parsons is certainly an American character worth remembering and worth admiring. He was a free spirit and an <gasps> independent thinker in an age when either of those things could land you in jail if you weren't careful. Mm. So while the Babylon working may not have been successful in the way Parsons wanted, his influence still matters. That is to say, Babylon or no, Jack Parsons still helped change our reality. He did. Wow. I, I really do believe it. I think that he was he was interesting. And what he did was that he brought if there was one thing he did, he was the figure of ritual magic for our age. Mm -hmm. Like he brought it, like, which is why we bring him into this fourth series that sort of like rounds out this section of like quote unquote modern ritual magic. Yeah. Where he brought it to a new height again. He kind of quote unquote made it cool because he brought into all these counterculture movements. I think there was something to it. Maybe Babylon working is why we got rock and roll. Maybe. Maybe it's not, I don't know. But I do have a really, I like this reading. I want to do a little reading. Okay. That's from Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword. And I think it really describes Parsons. Our significance does not lie in the extent to which we resemble others or in the extent to which we differ from them. It lies within our ability to be ourselves. And this may well be the entire object of life, to discover ourselves, our meaning, but this cannot be some sudden burst of illumination. It is a constant process which continues so long as we are truly alive. This process cannot continue unobstructed unless we are free to undergo all experience and willing to participate in all of existence. Then the significant questions are not, is it right or is it good? But rather, how does it feel and what does it mean? The McRib is also bad. God damn it. <laughs> and I, uh, God, you had a perfect it. opportunity to do Mahalo. Absolutely. That was Absolutely. a perfect opportunity for you to do what you started doing. Jazz, today. baby. It's the words you don't say. <laughs> I ear butted it. I ear planted it. And now people say it. Now, Mahalo. People are like, Mahalo. Now you just did ritual magic. All That's right. It's technically also PR. 
Absolutely. Well, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll be back next week, obviously, unless we're dead because we're going to get into explosives. Yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. we're supposed to get into rockets. Well, we, now that we're in L.A. together. Yeah, we have been talking about getting into rockets. Little but like, rockets? Little rockets. Yeah, yeah. Little, yeah. Rockets. Like the little um, rockets that you, you paint and, you you know, you yeah. put the little uh, cartridges in, you blast them off. I used to do it when I was a kid. I blew a bunch of shit up, you set it do, on fire uh, all the time. Oh, yeah, dude. It's you awesome. You can get into, uh, what was it? Uh, is it Love Liza? He gets into uh, RC racing. Yeah, RC cars. Yeah. RC cars. I'm That's kind of cool. I'm not going to live in our Love Liza life. Yeah, what's Love Liza? Have you ever seen that one with Philip Seymour Hoffman where he's huffing the gas? It's one of the most (laughs) depressing. That's what you want to do? It's one of the most depressing yet also heartwarming movies I've ever seen. It's funny and it ends with an explosion. It's funny, yeah. Wow, it does. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone. I just can't wait. I can close some tabs. I'm very happy that you can. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Do we have any other things to discuss? Uh, we have announced our new, because we are bumping up, because obviously Marcus is still getting over long COVID. He's doing great. I'm yeah, he's, 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 yeah. But it's still a process. So we are postponing our Australian tour to August. And yep. those, da- those dates are now put out there. But what we're coming, we can't Thank wait. Thank you to all can't my wait. Australian uh, friends for being understanding about the postponement. <laughs> this is, we didn't want to run into another situation where I get on the other side of the world and forget how to breathe again. Yes. I was watching an Australian comedian and they, they had the audience was in masks, but they had a really weird smile on the on the mask. Yeah, that's it scary. It was really trippy. Dude. That really, really scares me. It was scary. I'll show you a picture yeah. after. Yeah, I, I don't like I don't like fake smiles. It no, it was me. weird. Um, so do yourself a favor. I really feel like if you're I, again, if you're interested in more of this stuff, like read Jack Parsons' writings to kind of see how a wizard thinks. Yeah. It's yeah, you know, some of it's more impressive than others. Yeah. But freedom is a two edged sword, it's beautiful. It's nice. And uh, you know, just to bring a little bit of capitalism into this communism conversation. That's terrifying. Ben just showed me the picture. It's absolutely terrifying. Oh, wow. Oh, he, she likes it. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Um, if you're looking for a Christmas gift for one of your loved ones, go to lastpodcastmerch.com. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We got an ornament. Yeah, we got an ornament. Get yourself a three-headed doll. <laughs> it's cute. Yeah. It is cute. It is cute. They did a good job. Oh, or buy the book. Or buy the uh, Trade of Soul Plumber, which came yes. out a couple of months yes, ago. It's on sale. That's a great sale. idea. Yeah. Also, we are going to, um, we're going to be making an announcement about another project pretty soon. But yeah. I don't know when that is. So. Very cool shit. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Hail yourselves. Hail Satan. Hail Gene. Congratulations, everybody. Hail me. Because there's only one me, and it's gotta be me. Oh, shit. Got one more thing. Okay. The new No Dogs in Space series yeah, has started. We with have a Patty Smith. Patty Smith Part nice. 1 and Part 2 are currently out. It's a three part series. If you want to wait for the whole thing to be out, the third part will be out next week. But yeah, Part 1 and 2 are out. We're very proud of this one. So go on and check out Fantastic. Patty Smith if you're interested in one of the godmothers of punk. She's Ooh. like a lot more rocking than I thought she was. So much more. She's great. Bye! See you in hell! (laughs) There you go. Now you got it. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.